Good afternoon. What a beautiful day out here in St. Paul. Welcome to the first ever Lunch and Learn. My name is Mike Marcotte with Open Arms of Minnesota. So excited to have you here with us live via Zoom and Facebook. Thank you for tuning in with us. So today is the first ever Lunch and Learn. It's part of a series. We'll get to that in a little bit. But this is your chance to see inside Open Arms and what makes up the different parts of the Open Arms engine. Um, and Open Arms, we are busier than ever. We are now serving 1,400 clients every single week here in the Twin Cities area, more than we've ever served in our 34 year history. And due to COVID-19, we have had to place restrictions on the number of volunteers we've had to allow into the building and the types of events that we can hold. And what that means is that so many of you watching at home have wanted to volunteer with us and haven't had the chance to. You've wanted to help out in any way you can uh, and we haven't had the opportunities for you to do so. We've had to place restrictions on who can volunteer in our kitchen in South Minneapolis, who can be out at our farms, which we'll show you around here in a little bit, uh, and who can be at our events, which we honestly haven't had any events and we really want you to be a part of those. Open Arms has been a part of your life for so long. For many of you, you've volunteered with Open Arms for decades and we so appreciate that. So that's what Lunch and Learn is all about. We want you to just see a little bit of what we're up to this summer and how exciting we are uh, and all the things that we have been doing to keep you informed um, and keep you uh, kind of engaged with us. And just as a thank you for all of your support of our organization. We're also going to answer your questions today. There's tons of questions about vegetable gardening that we've already received and we would love to hear your other questions. So whether you are on Zoom or on Facebook, we have operators standing by to answer your gardening questions. And we have a mastermind. I cannot answer a single question about gardening, but we do have a mastermind here uh, right next to me. We'll get to her in a second. And we'll answer your questions coming up. So start posting them now. We have folks ready to answer your questions coming up in a little bit. Um, just before we get to open farms and what our farm program is all about, I do want to tell you a couple things. Coming up two weeks from today on July 29th, our chief executive officer, Leah Abear wells will be answering all of your questions about open arms as a whole. So where we're at right now with COVID-19, I got my mask here, where we're at with COVID-19, where Open Arms is headed uh, as we celebrate 35 years in 2021. Very exciting for us. So make sure you tune in two weeks from today on July 29th at noon for that session. And then on Wednesday, August 12th, our team of registered dietitians will all gather on this call and we'll show you how we create medically tailored meals for all of those 1400 clients that we serve here in the Twin Cities. Also, how do we get away with giving all those cookies and cakes away? You know, that's a lot of sugar. So how do we put that into a medically tailored meal? We're gonna give you those answers coming up on August 12th. And if you haven't signed up for those sessions, you can head to our website, openarmsmn.org and sign up and we'll give you reminders so you don't miss a beat as to what we're up to. But today, it's very exciting. It's a gorgeous day and we are live at Open Farms. Open Arms operates five organic farms in the Twin Cities around the Metro, two in Minneapolis, two in St. Paul and one out east in Afton, Minnesota. And we're live at Hope Farm. We're right off of West 7th Street uh, just east of 35E in St. Paul. And I am honored to introduce to you my socially distanced coworker. This is Kelly Wilson <laughs> from Open Arms of Minnesota. Kelly, Hi. how are you? I'm well. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. So um, in a moment, Kelly's going to give us a tour of Open Farms. Uh, and this is such a beautiful spot. Um, and she's going to answer those questions you have. I can't answer any of those questions. But Kelly, let's talk some numbers. Okay. This farm, I know you can only see a part of it here. Uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or on Zoom, how big is this farm, Kelly? This farm is roughly a quarter acre in size. Um, we have two different sections. <clears throat> the one behind me, you can see, and then a larger section, which you'll get to see a little bit later, um, but approximately about a quarter acre in size. It's one of our larger urban farms. And overall, the five farms in total, how big are all those acres that we're um, 
able to plant all these veggies in. So it's just under two acres. So like 1.875 is the figure that I came up with. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that equates to how many plants and how many seeds? So we started this year um, just over 9,000 seedlings Whoa. indoors at Open Arms. Um, and that doesn't include the crops that are direct seeded into the ground, like your beets, um, carrots, spinach, those kinds of things. Um, but we are growing right around 40 different crops. Um, and within those 40 crops, about 130 different varieties. So. Wow. And that equates to how much food? So each year we're able to produce anywhere between 13,000 and 15,000 pounds. 13 to 15,000 pounds of food a year? Yeah. Wow. Um, and those seeds, they're coming from where? So we um, were donated seeds by certain individuals. Um, we also purchased seeds through Johnny's, um, Fedco, Seed Savers, which I love. A lot of heirloom, really uh, unique varieties come from there. Um, and then also um, Jordan Seeds over in Woodbury is also a place that I get seeds more local, locally owned mom pa shop over there. So I know you're excited about <laughs> what's growing behind you. So why don't you give us a little bit of a tour here, show us what's growing, give us a little bit of a tutorial of, uh, of what is going on here at the uh, Open Farms. Cool, okay. So directly behind me, we have green beans. Um, this variety is a bush variety, it's called Strike. Um, they're pretty prolific in that um, you can see here, these beans are ready for picking. So if you're watching and you have a CSA share with us, you can expect these in your share tomorrow. Um, we also have right over here, peppers. Um, our peppers started struggling a little bit early season, but they're starting to pick up a bit. This is a bell variety right here. Um, and then if you come down this way, we've got some really gorgeous banana peppers in here. Those oh, will also be in tomorrow's box. <laughs> oh my gosh, they're gorgeous. Yeah, these are really starting to thrive with the heat we've had the past few months. The peppers are just really loving it up. So, all right. Um, behind me, we've got um, some tomatoes. These are a beefsteak variety. What is thriving right now in this weather? This is like, it's so, been a little warm, right? It's been really warm. So our peppers, um, eggplants, tomatoes, all of our squash, so zucchini, green beans, any of those like warm season, heat loving crops are doing really well. Um, things that don't really like the heat, like spinach, your lettuce greens, those kinds of things. They're taking a break for a while, but we'll come back this fall when temps cool down a bit. So. And you're pulling beans this week. What else are you pulling out of the garden? We'll do the goddess peppers, which are the banana peppers. Um, we're pulling some spring onions. Um, we've got some potatoes that are ready to harvest, which I'll show you when we head over there. Okay. Um, we've also got some kale that's ready. Um, garlic's being harvested today in Afton as I speak. So that'll be ready soon. And do all the gardens grow the same items or do they grow different varieties? We grow different things at each site. So we like to do crop rotations that helps keep um, pests down and different kind of soil borne bacteria um, or pathogens that can affect our plants. We do a good mix at each site. Um, last year, this site had a lot of tomatoes. So this year you won't see many tomatoes here. Um, in our South Minneapolis farm, it's kind of shady and cooler, so we grow a lot of our greens there. Um, this is obviously full sun, wide open, so you're going to see more of those heat-loving crops here. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned the CSA program that you run. Tell us a little yep. bit more about that. Yeah, so we offer um, CSA box, so you can purchase a share at the beginning of the season, and then you'll get a box of produce throughout the growing season um, for us, which is about 16 weeks. Um, shares usually begin middle of June and we'll wrap up end of September, early October. Um, each box you're getting eight to 10 different types of vegetables and then any sort of herbs that we also have in season. And they're sold out this year. They are sold out this year, yes, which is really exciting. And how many boxes do you end up producing each year? So this year we have 35 shares a week. That's great, that's a lot of veggies. It is a lot of veggies, yeah, that's great. Wow. <laughs> Um, and then keep an eye out on open arm social media because you're going to have some extra produce at the end of the season. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so um, we did this last year and we're going to do it again this year. Um, we'll be offering canning shares. So we're going to have our um, 
big slicing tomatoes, canning tomatoes. We'll box those up in either 20 or 10 pound boxes. So you can take those home and can with them, make sauce, whatever you want to do. We'll also do a salsa share, um, which will have tomatoes, uh, peppers, and onions and garlic. And then we're also offering a pesto share um, with all the fixings to make pesto as well. And tell us a little bit about this land that we're on. So open, uh, open arms and open farms, we take land, we, we're borrowing land from folks. And we have a great partnership with Shalom Home, which is right behind Kyle, our beautiful photographer here today. <laughs> um, and we work with them to take this land and use it for great purposes, right? Yep, yep absolutely. And so we're all on, we're all on borrowed land or leased land. Um, here we are on Shalom's property and it's been a great relationship with them. Um, typically in the spring, we actually partner with um, residents and we'll have them doing seed starting projects for us. Obviously this year because of COVID-19, that wasn't a possibility, but we hope to revisit that in the future. That's really um, a great thing for us to be able to do and also just like to include the older generation in um, helping kind of develop this garden. Absolutely, so, how fun is that? Yeah, it's awesome. Great way to partner with a, another great organization for totally. the Twin Cities. Yeah. Okay, why don't you lead the way okay. to our next spot and I'm gonna talk to you guys watching come with me. So this is our Lunch and Learn series. This is the first one. We are at Open Farms. We're at the Hope Farm. We're in St. Paul, right off of West 7th Street. And uh, we'd love for you to join us on July 29th and August 12th on Facebook and on Zoom for other sessions. All the information, openarmsmn.org. Kelly, you have great stuff going. Yeah. Um, is what is this guy? Because he's cute. Oh, it's a sunflower. Oh, yeah, it's actually a volunteer sunflower. Um, we planted them intentionally the first year. So that was three years ago at this garden. And since then, they've just reseeded themselves. And they're always a nice surprise in the spring. So what will you do with the sunflower? We will just leave it for the pollinators and the birds. They'll just come and eat the seeds and drop the seeds. The next year, we'll have sunflowers growing again. <laughs> <laughs> just everywhere? Yep, they just pop up everywhere. Oh, so. how fun is that? Yeah. Um, and uh, birds are volunteers because they're helping repopulate all the sunflowers yep. in your garden. Let's talk about the volunteer program um, that you have and tell me about how your volunteers are helping, what a volunteer <laughs> shift looks like out here at Open Farms. Totally. So volunteers are crucial to have out here. Um, obviously, the weeds grow just as fast as our plants and the plants can't get in the ground without a lot of help. So um, you know, volunteers can expect to come out and do a little bit of everything out here. Um, early season, we'll do a lot of bed prep, um, seeding, planting, and then kind of maintenance, weeding. This time of year, we're really focusing on feeding the weeds so that our plants can really thrive. Um, behind me, you can see we've got the grass here is just kind of a little bit insane. So it's been <laughs> great to have volunteers come and um, we actually had a crew out here yesterday morning and afternoon just tackling a lot of this grass and so that's super helpful. Um, folks can, if you're not already a volunteer, you can head over to our website, um, click on the volunteer tab, and then you can kind of follow, follow the prompts and um, get signed up to come out here or at any of our other sites. So, How long is a volunteer shift out here at Hope Farm? So volunteer shifts are, the, are two hours, um, same as they are in the building. And um, we provide all of the tools necessary. We also have um, clean gloves when you show up. Um, and then because we are outdoors, it's really easy for us to socially distance. So you know that, you know, if you wanna get outside and do something and also give back, um, this is a great way to do it. And also by being safe too. Yeah. Distance. And you can volunteer as an individual or a group and all that information is on our website, as Kelly mentioned, openarmsmn.org. Uh, and we love corporate groups. So if you haven't seen your coworkers in a while, what a great way to get involved and get outside and see each other for, you know, whether it is socially distant like this. Ah, we're good. We're even six feet apart. I like that. Um, what is growing out here in this uh, part of the garden? Tell us. So um, right here we have kale. Um, this variety is red Russian kale. And we're actually harvesting this today um, and, or, and or tomorrow to bring into the kitchen for use in client meals this week. So that's pretty exciting. Um, right behind me, we have red cabbage. Um, there's some variance in sizes because we planted the seedlings the first time and then filled in where plants had died off. And so we'll have a little bit of staggered harvest here. When did this get planted? So these, all of the cool season crops, so the cabbages, the kales, um, 
those things got in the ground probably like the second week of May, um, third week of May, once the ground had warmed up and um, we got bed prep done. And then everything else, all of the warm season crops have kind of filtered in since then. So um, I'd say that this site was completely planted definitely by the end of May. Okay. So. And now you're starting to pull. So once this kale gets pulled this week, does something replace this kale? Well, so actually kale is one of those cool crops that you can plant and then you continue to harvest until the fall. And so we really? will, this week we're going to go and we're going to harvest probably two, well, maybe like a half of the plant, leaving about a half to two thirds of the plant to rejuvenate itself. And then in about another two weeks, it'll be ready to harvest again. Um, and then into the fall, we'll be able to keep on harvesting. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> so kale's a great thing to put in your garden. Totally, exactly. Because you can have sustained harvest over a long period of time. Oh, so, yeah. Well, this is great because I know nothing about gardening. So I'm learning <laughs> something good here. Hope you are too. What else is growing out here in the garden? So um, I want to point these out because a lot of people don't ever see purple beans, but they're one of my favorites. Purple um, beans, because Kelly? They're, they're gorgeous. Oh my gosh, they are. So I look at the flowers. So these are... Um, and those are edible. These are edible. Yep. And when you cook them, they actually turn green. So no when heat is applied, they turn green. So if you steam them or if you you know, saute them, um, they're going to turn into a green bean. But. Are these ready to pull? Are these like these? So we harvested. Harvest? Yep. Some of these are ready for harvest. We did do a pretty heavy pick yesterday. Um, so these will also be in the CSA boxes this week. Um, and then because you see all of these flowers, they're going to be ready to pick again real soon. Are the flowers edible? You know, <laughs> I've never eaten a bean flower. <laughs> I've eaten a lot of flowers, but not a bean flower. We, we won't do it live on Facebook and Zoom in case something happens. And we, we don't want you to have an allergic reaction right, right now. The purple beans. Yeah. And uh, they're green on the inside too. So that's fun. Oh my gosh. How cool is that? That's amazing. And yeah. those go, do those go in meals for clients and then into the CSAs as well? They do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So whatever. I'm flabbergasted. I'm learning something new here. This is amazing. Awesome. Um, that's fantastic. Well, uh, I know people are itching to ask you questions. Yeah, for sure. You ready to answer some totally. and tackle some? Okay, so we're going to get Kyle into a position so he doesn't have to hold his arms up for 45 minutes. We have a lot of questions. Some of you already submitted them while you registered. Thank you so much for doing so. Kelly's ready to answer all of them. <laughs> Kelly, you ready for this? Yep. We got six feet. All right, question number one. Um, how do you prune vine plants like cucumber, squash, or pumpkin, and should you even prune them? That's a good question. So in my experience growing vining crops like cucumber, squash, or pumpkin, I typically choose not to prune. Um, and <laughs> maybe that's taking the lazy way, but <laughs> <laughs> um, typically, so with cucumbers, we trellis them. So we have them growing up a fence. Um, if you take one of those vining crops, it will kind of go crazy and take up a lot of space. If you can force it to go vertical, you can save a lot of space in the garden. Um, so that's what we do with our cucumbers. Um, as far as pumpkins and squash go, or pumpkins and melons, you can um, prune off its kind of leader vine. You can cut it, so then it will send out more shoots, which will, will actually increase the amount of fruits per plant. Um, I don't know if that will help you save space, but you'll definitely get more um, or melons on your mm -hmm. melon plant. Um, if you're trying to grow like a state for pumpkin, you can clip the vines that are going to the other pumpkins that are smaller than the main one. And then that plant's going to take all its energy and put it into that award winning pumpkin. Are you growing <laughs> pumpkins out here at any of the farms? We are not. So okay. we, we just recently started growing winter squash and some of those things that take up more space because we have been, you know, in the city on limited land space. Now that we're out in Afton, mm -hmm. we have about an acre to play with. And so we are growing winter squash, we're growing cantaloupe, we're growing um, sugar baby watermelons out there. So they can kind of just take over. And before we get to more questions, I, I don't want to forget about all of the interns that help you out. Yes. We should mention them because well, they do a lot of work for they you. They do. My intern team is fantastic. And I hope some of them watch this later. I know they were all cheering me on when I left the farm today, but um, I have a crew of six this year and they have been totally instrumental in helping with every aspect of the farm from, you know, early season seeding to bed prep and planting. 
Um, they work great with the volunteers. So I'm sure if you volunteered, you've also met my amazing intern team, but they're fantastic. Oh, good. Yeah. Shout out to all of the interns at Open Arms. I know we have a ton in the office and you have a lot that you manage at all of the farm sites. Um, questions are coming in on my Apple Watch. <laughs> Kelly, how do you keep animals out of the crops? That is the question I get a lot. Um, so I need some wood to knock on. Luckily here, <laughs> we haven't had much of an issue with um, rabbits or anything like that. Um, we are really close to the river and there's a lot of eagles that fly around here. So I'm guessing this isn't the safest place for them to be. Um, you know, at some of our other sites, we, we do have fences. Mm -hmm. um, we also use things like floating row cover, which is like a woven poly fabric that you'll put over your plants. Um, over the top of them? Yep. So like right after you would plant, you would lay the fabric over them. You tuck it down tight with um, lands landscape stakes. Okay. And then it protects them while they're young. Um, so if a, uh, Hungry Bunny came along and was able to get to your plant because it's covered with a fabric sheet. Basically. Oh. But it lets the water and the sunlight in, so. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's a fun question. I like this one. Why doesn't my cilantro look like the cilantro that I can buy at the farmer's market? That's a great question. So <laughs> cilantro is a challenging crop for a lot of people to grow. A lot of people ask me this question a lot. Mm -hmm. um, cilantro does not like hot weather. Um, you should definitely always start it from seed in your garden. If you buy a transplant from the farmer's market and plant it in your garden, that's most likely going to bolt within the first two weeks, especially if the weather gets hot. Um, best chances would be to plant it right about now so that it's starting to grow during these cooler coming months in August and September. And then you probably will end up with farmer's market. There you go. There you go. That's some pro tips right there. Um, uh, more questions. Here we go. Will there be ground cherries this year? Yes, we do have ground cherries planted. Um, this is are those difficult to grow? They are difficult to grow, okay. but they are time consuming to harvest. So if you're one of, just because of the size, they're tiny and they, they fall to the ground. And so it's just, Oh, hence the name. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they also, they also kind of tuck low to the ground. Okay. But yes, we will have those. We'll have them in the CSA shares. We'll also have them at the kitchen. Um, and we'd love volunteers to help come and pick, you know, in August when they start coming in. So <laughs> when is your biggest need for volunteers out here at the farms? Is it in, at the beginning of the season it, yeah. or is it at harvest? It really varies. So beginning of the season, um, we, we need a lot of volunteers to get everything. Everything goes in at once. And it's this madness of, you know, two, three weeks of getting all of the farms prepped and then planted. Mm -hmm. And so um, volunteers are key then. This time of year, you know, volunteers are helping us so that we're not drowning in weeds. <laughs> <laughs> and then come August, you know, we'll be harvesting at um, a lot of the sites. And so that's also crucial. Really, volunteers are great on the farm anytime of the season. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it, the ships are pretty labor intensive, I'm guessing. They can be, but don't let that scare you off. Okay. I, um, we do a good job accommodating. So um, you know, individuals that may have some mobility issues, you know, we're not going to have you bending over picking weeds the entire time. Like, we like to switch things up um, and make it comfortable for people. So. And this is a great activity for families to do. Definitely. Yep. Um, we allow children above the age of six to come out and volunteer with an adult chaperone. Um, and it's been great having kids out on the farm. I actually had a crew out um, in Afton this spring and they helped plant our entire entire potato crop out there, which is looking marvelous right now. So oh, good. yeah, we had a group of about six kids that day. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question about seeds uh, from someone who registered. What is the cost to, to seed a garden? Um, and then what improvements would Open Arms like to invest in to make these gardens more productive? Cool. So two questions. So the cost to seed a garden is really variable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could spend very little to seed your garden, depending on the types of vegetables you wanted to grow and where you source your seeds. Um, you know, we live in Twin Cities, which has a pretty thriving, um, you know, like community garden, backyard gardener scene. And so I hear a lot about seed swaps and places where you can go to get free seed, actually. There's seed banks. I know there's one on the west side of St. Paul. Um, but then again, there are also, you know, expensive seeds. So if you want to plant that, like, brand new hybrid variety tomato. You're bougie gonna, seeds. Right, bougie seeds. You're going to pay a little <laughs> bit extra. 
Um, but if you kind of stick to the tried and true, maybe some open pollinated heirloom varieties, those end up costing a little bit less. Good to know. Um, this is a question about garlic. Um, so this person asks, I've used some of my garlic scrapes in cooking and floral arrangements. I didn't know you could do that. That's something I just learned. Um, do I cut the, off the rest to send more energy to the bulb? Yes, you definitely want to cut your garlic scapes. Um, is that is how you pronounce that word? Scapes. Oh, that's fun. I've learned that too. <laughs> yep. So they, that's the flower stalk, basically. They're ready to harvest when they come up and they do a loop. They kind of do a loop to loop and then you okay. kind of snap them off. Um, they're great in pesto. You can add them to vegetable dishes. Um, it's like a lighter garlicky flavor, but still has that like really fresh garlic taste. Um, and then, yeah, you'll definitely want to pull them off the rest of your plants. Um, the theory is if you pluck the garlic scape off, it's going to take the energy and send it back down to the bulb. And then therefore the bulb of garlic will, will get bigger. So. Very good. Yeah. How do you decide what you're planting every year at the farm? Um, well, it kind of depends on what we planted where last year. Like okay. I said before, we do crop rotation. Um, I also consult the chefs at Open Arms to see what they want, what they can use in their meals. Um, and then for CSA, you know, we like to provide a variety of things. Um, you know, we don't want to just give you kale for the entire summer. <laughs> so <laughs> we could give you kale for the entire yeah, summer. Yeah, you have a lot of it. My gosh, it's growing like weeds. <laughs> yeah, so I do, I like to do a variety. Um, you know, a lot of the tried and true things that people are used to, like beans and broccoli, cabbages, peppers, tomatoes, and then throw in some of those like more funky unique varieties mm -hmm. that maybe you wouldn't see at the grocery store. The purple beans. Like the purple beans. Purple beans. Yeah. Uh, beyond volunteers, how are you controlling all the weeds? So. Because <laughs> you have volunteers weeding out yes. here. Yes. Actually, to circle back to that uh, one question that I did not answer. Oh, yes, yes, yes. please do. So um, things that we could use to become more productive. So we do use things like landscape fabric to help control our weeds. Um, we don't use that at every single site. We do have it here on our cabbage plants and some of our uh, tomato plants will plant directly into landscape fabric, um, especially if you're going to be there for a long part of the season. Um, you know, um, it would be amazing to eventually get some sort of high tunnel or hoop house out in Afton. Um, you know, that would allow us to extend the season on both ends and we could be bringing in like fresh greens earlier in the season for the kitchen and then later again at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. um, and then because we have this additional acre out in Afton um, and our backs are only so strong, you know, <laughs> having like a tiller out there would be, okay. would make us way more productive and save us loads of time. Um, what are the, before we get to that next question that I jumped to, uh, what are the day-to-day -day supplies that you're looking for um, here on the farm that people could donate? Sure. So um, right now we are in need of straw. Um, you know, it's a great, we use it as mulch. It helps to beat leaf. Mm -hmm. It also helps to conserve soil moisture. Um, and those are things that we really need these days, especially when we don't get rain for a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, so soil. Um, you know, right now we're, um, I'm using granulated poultry manure fertilizer to feed our plants. Um, those are always things that we could use more of. Um, yeah. Those are all good things to ask yeah. for. Yeah. Leaves in the fall, if you need to get rid of your leaves, we incorporate them into our beds and then they'll break down. And then in the spring, it just adds more organic material as well. Okay. So. Um, and what people can do if you're interested in donating any of that uh, stuff to Kelly and the Open Farms team, uh, head to openarmsmn.org. Uh, you can actually make a donation um, of stuff, of supplies to us. Um, you can set up a donation drive um, as well. And that information is on the donate page. Just scroll to the bottom of that page and you'll find actually my information. You can get a hold of me um, and we can set up a drive and figure out logistics on how to get that inf that supply in stuff. Yeah, I'll call it stuff awesome. out here to the farm <laughs> sites. Um, gloves, gloves, hoses. Gloves, hoses, yeah. Um, you know, hand tools, um, tools, tools, you know, shovels, hose, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Always in high demand, <laughs> especially since we have five farms. So. Uh, more questions coming in via my phone. Someone got my phone number. <laughs> uh, my monster tomato plants are seven feet tall and Ooh, growing. Those are yeah. monstrous. 
Nice. Um, I am only pruning the suckers. Yep. I'm sure that's a term that I just don't know what that yes. means. Okay, you're going to have to explain what that means. What should I do to maximize the yield? You're doing exactly what you need to do by pruning the suckers. Um, what are suckers? So suckers, tomato plants, so they like to, so you'll have like your main stem and then on each branch at the kind of the patch of the branch, yep. it's going to send out a little baby plant. It's called a sucker. It oh. basically become its own tomato plant. Okay. Um, but oh. if you keep pinching those back, then it's going to take that energy into, you know, its first initial blossoms and fruit um, yield. And so that's exactly what you need to do. Just keep pruning the suckers. Um, you know, you could use a foliar application of like seaweed or fishy motion, um, top dressing with compost, um, granulated poultry manure, just making sure that it has all of the nutrients that it needs to thrive. Um, do you plant cover crops over the winter out here at Open Farms? We have in the past. Um, we typically don't do that in the city. Um, we have planted winter rye out in Afton. Um, it's a bigger land space. What is winter rye? It is the cold, hardy crop that you seed in the fall. Okay. And then it's one of the first things to come up in the spring. And so it'll help to um, kind of beat out those like early season spring deeds. And then you, you mow it down and then you till it in and it becomes a green manure. Oh. So as it breaks down, it's releasing. You don't eat this winter rye. No. It sounds like a bread. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like I would bake with it. Right. I would I would make a nice sandwich out of it. <laughs> but I don't want to eat this winter rye. You I mean you probably could. But... Okay, it's like those flowers. I probably could eat them, but yeah. I would have an allergic reaction all over my face. Um uh, we need some gardening tips and ideas if you have some for apartment dwellers, Kelly. What do yeah. you got? Okay, so for apartment dwellers, I would suggest always herbs. You know, they're easy to grow in pots. They don't take up a lot of space, but then you get that freshness when you're cooking your meals. Um, basil is always like a must have, unless you don't like basil and then oh, don't yeah. grow it. But um, cilantro also will grow in pots well. Um, and then also things like any sort of like bush type variety. Um, they have actually developed like patio tomatoes. They're a determinant variety that, you know, maybe only grow about three feet tall and they get bushy rather than like seven feet, like that, you know, that mm -hmm. person's tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, so focusing more on those kinds of things. And then um, kind of going vertical because I'm guessing like if you have a small, you know, terrace in your apartment, um, growing things upwards. So if you wanted to grow like some pole beans, just like grow them vertically up. Oh, sure. Up yeah. A few poles, yeah. you know, just kind of save space. But yeah, look for those bush type varieties. Cucumbers are sold bush type varieties and then also tomatoes. Bush so, type variety. Yeah. Got it. Um, which crop is the most nutritious per square foot? Is it kale? So that's a really good <laughs> question. I, I, I am not a registered dietitian, so tune back in at the next Lunch and Learn. Okay. Oh, yeah, the dietitians are coming up in <laughs> August. But as a farmer, I would say kale is definitely one of the most nutritious foods on the planet. Um, spinach is also very nutritious. Sure. And so this one's kind of tough. Um, I would say I would say kale for your garden because you can plant it, and then you can keep harvesting it consistently throughout the growing season. Mm -hmm. Whereas spinach, if you're gonna, you know, plant a few rows of spinach, you might get pre-harvest off of it, and then it's gonna bolt, and you have to pull it out and replant it. So you're getting more bang for your buck with planting kale. So kale is the way to go. I think so. Kale, yeah. Yes, I, some, <laughs> not not everybody will agree with that. <laughs> oh, oh, there's the controversy in the kale front. Oh my gosh, I didn't not know. Not everybody loves kale as much as I do, but I'm a fan of kale. Great. I like it. Um, tell us a little bit more. I know we touched on the internship program that you operate and run at Open Farms. Tell us how, uh, who you're looking for, how people can get involved, because I know you'll be looking for people next summer. Totally. Yep. So um, the internship program, um, anybody is welcome to apply. You don't have to be a student. Um, you don't have to necessarily have any background experience in farming. We do a lot of hands-on training. Um, you know, if you're eager to learn and you have um, a passion for local food, food justice, and um, for the mission of Open Arms, you know, feel free to apply. Um, interns spend anywhere from three to six months out here on the farm wow. with myself and the rest of the team. Um, we do, you know, we do a little bit of everything. They help in the planning, like the early, early season seeding, um, bed prep, um, you know, 
seedling planting, maintenance, harvest, a little bit of everything. Um, so you're really getting like, you know, start to finish during the growing season. Mm -hmm. um, we try to allow time for special projects. So if somebody's really interested in compost tea or um, building out, you know, vermicomposting, which is worm composting, you know, working with those kinds of things, um, we like to allow some time for that, some like research, mm -hmm. um, which would help out us, obviously. Um, but yeah, folks can go to our webpage. Um, we're actually seeking a couple of interns to help round out the rest of the season. Um, like I said, I have a super solid team of six, but some of them will be wrapping up their internship in September. And our farming season is going to go probably into November, as long as we don't get any snow. Before wow, that. you'll be out here till November. I have harvested carrots on November 28th one year. So, no way, that's yeah. like Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. Wow. My goal. Um, you mentioned <laughs> compost tea. Yeah. What is that? So it is kind of like, a, it's a power liquid. So you take your compost. Um, some people put in molasses and some other um, organic materials. And then you basically let it brew. Okay. Um, you put an aerator in it. So like a fish tank pump or something like that. And then you let it brew for a couple of days. And it just turns into this like luscious liquid that you can then spray on your plants and you don't drink it no it's like I the winter rye it. it's like winter <laughs> rye you don't you don't I would definitely drink. not drink compost tea okay probably won't kill you but don't drink it <laughs> <laughs> but it's really high in like micronutrients and just really really so you spray great. it on your yep crops. you can do either a foliar application or you can you know take a couple cups of it and just individually water each plant and you're doing a lot of composting out here i know that the bin is right behind our camera guy kyle yep yeah so we obviously we're composting any of the cold produce that we don't take into the kitchen or put in CSA, um, any of our weeds that haven't seeded already, those are going into the compost. And then we'll also pull produce scraps from the open arms building. So say they're doing food prep and um, if you worked in the kitchen, you know, a lot of prep goes on. So we've uh, sidelined that stuff and brought out um, food scraps to make compost from them as well. So, wow. Yeah. You're busy out here, Kelly. I am busy. I, I learned something about <laughs> winter rye that I shouldn't drink, but eat that and drink the compost tea. I learned what not to eat. I learned that kale is growing like tumbleweed. So yeah, okay, it's crazy. It is. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'll do a six feet away. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. You are awesome today. Thank you so much for uh, answering our questions. My pleasure. For giving us a tour of the farm. <laughs> Um, I know you have a busy day and a busy summer here. You're growing a lot of stuff. Yes. 15,000 pounds of food. Yes. Yeah. So you, I'm sure you have places to be. I do. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it's it. It's my pleasure. Yes. <laughs> um, so, and thank you for watching with us. So again, um, all of this information, openarmsmn.org, uh, at the top of our website, there's an about us section, and then there's a little tab that says open farm. So you can learn about volunteering here at open farms are five sites around the Twin Cities, two in Minneapolis, two in St. Paul, one out east in Afton, as Kelly was mentioning. So you can learn all about the open farms experience. Also on our website, of all sorts of different ways on how you can get involved donating supplies to us. We love supplies out here at the farm. Uh, we're also looking for other supplies uh, like boxes of Cheerios that we can give to our clients, the 1,400 clients that we serve every week. Our next Lunch and Learn series session is coming up on Wednesday, July 29th with our Chief Executive Officer. Her name is Leah Aver Wells, and she is going to tell you about the kind of the state of the union when it comes to open arms, where we've been at with COVID-19, and where we're headed in 2021 as we celebrate 35 years of open arms and serving meals that nourish to our neighbors here in the Twin Cities. Uh, once again, my name is Mike Marcotte uh, with Open Arms in Minnesota. We really appreciate you tuning in and joining us today. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Stay safe and stay healthy.